3DO. They came from the depths of the void, an ancient enemy of an ancient people. No one knows why they hate us so, or why they have made war upon us. Some say the struggle against their evil is the mandate of heaven. All right. So, welcome. I'm Cherokee Starfish, and uh, back in my day, there was a game called Might and Magic 6, The Mandate of Heaven. And I lost so many hours to this game as a kid. Um, it's one of my favorites. Even now, I still go back probably once every couple of years or so and play it again. Um, it's part of a really great series of games. The whole Might and Magic franchise, I, I pretty much recommend all of them except for... Uh, one one or two exceptions. Might and Magic 9 was not very good. Um, Heroes of Might and Magic 4, 6, and 7 are not great. But otherwise, um, definitely would recommend. And this is a first-person RPG. It's a fairly open world. Um, you create your party. You've got the... Um, characters down at the bottom of the screen kind of eye of the beholder style and this was heavily influenced by games like that by wizardry and similar that were kind of before its time um, this was a mid 90s game and so around that time I was probably in the oh seventh or eighth grade maybe when this came out and I played it so much and I'm going to play it again now because I feel like there's a lot of folks out there who are especially younger than me but also even of the same age who maybe didn't get to see this game um, the first time around and I would love to share it with you and I hope that you will enjoy it as much as I still enjoy it after all these years so um you know, if you are watching the stream and you've got any friends that you want to invite to come check it out, see what you think and participate, then that is awesome. Um, of course, if you enjoy it, please do give me a follow and uh, uh, have fun in the chat. Just, you know, keep it clean, be kind to each other, and um, let's have some fun. I'm going to get started here. I'm going to let the narrator take over for a moment. During the night of shooting stars. You find yourself as far from your village of Sweetwater as old Falagar's magic could take you. Three years have passed while Falagar imparted what knowledge he could to train you in your chosen professions. But the time came at last when he could teach you no more, and you have ventured into the world to seek your fame and fortune. Now, a world away from your lost home, you have stumbled across evidence of a terrible conspiracy involving a new religious cult. Five letters from King Roland to his wife Catherine, and a letter from the King of the Devils to a wicked traitor named Sulman, have turned up in an abandoned goblin camp. Your fate seems inextricably bound to these letters and that awful night, and your role in the events to come may be larger than anyone could imagine. The tools you have are but a small sum of gold, your wits, and a lot of potential. The roads ahead are infinite, and all the choices are yours to make. So choose wisely. Good luck. Thank you, Anonymous Narrator. And now we are looking at the gates of New Sorbagal, the initial town that the game drops you into, uh, which is part of uh, the... Kingdom of, um, I almost called it Erathia. No, that's from Heroes of Might and Magic 3. Well, we'll get there. Um, so, I feel like there's a little bit of a plot hole there. Old Falagar, he's actually a hero from the um, turn based strategy side of the franchise, Falagar. And in here, he's a gate master, a portal wizard. And um, he saves you inexplicably and trains you for three years to fight the demons that destroyed your home. And the three-year part, I feel like, is a number that they picked kind of at random. Um, they needed something that was believable so that you 
didn't just magically go from nobodies who almost got killed by the demons to competent adventurers here when you start the game. Um, but at the same time, I feel like, you know, three years after the demons destroyed Sweetwater, um, there just probably would be a lot less of the kingdom left than there really is, as you'll see that, you know, it's, it's largely undamaged as we go through it. So, uh, so this is the default party that they give you to start out. Um... Now, in some of the other games, like Might and Magic 7 and 8, you can mix and match portraits and voices. Uh, in this game, you can choose a portrait uh, for each character, but the voice is attached to them. You can't change it, so... I'm ready. Choose me. I'm the one you want. And so you can hear that they just kind of are who they are, so each face kind of comes with a personality attached. Uh, now we can change their classes, and we can change their names. So uh, I'm going to go over that real quick, and I think that um, since there's a couple of people in the stream here, I'm going to let y'all kind of help build the party here and decide who we go through the game as. Um, so down here you'll see there's six classes, Knight, Paladin, Cleric, Archer, Sorcerer, and Druid. Um... They give you a Paladin, Archer, Cleric, and Sorcerer as the default party, and one of the reasons for that is probably because it's about the best, most basic party build. Um, the Knight and the Druid are objectively the worst classes, I think. Uh, they're not bad, they're not unplayable, and I have gone through the game with one of each before, uh, but the Knight is basically the ultimate warrior, and the Druid is the ultimate spellcaster, which is why you can kind of see them on opposite ends of the spectrum here. Uh, the Knight gets no magic of any kind ever, but has the most hit points and can learn all weapons and armor. Uh, the Druid uh, is probably the second most mediocre fighter after the Sorcerer, but they can learn every type of magic except for the two most powerful kinds, which are light and dark magic, which we don't get into until significantly later in the game. Uh, the Paladin is a cross between the Knight and Cleric. Uh, he wears heavy armor, uses a wide variety of weapons, and can learn pretty much any kind of magic that the Cleric can except for light magic. Uh, the Archer is like a cross between the Knight and the Sorcerer. They are the only character that starts out with a non-magical ranged attack, and they eventually become battle mages. They can learn the four elemental types of magic, and they're medium armor, medium weapons. And then the Cleric and the Sorcerer are exactly what you would expect. They can learn Light and Dark Magic later. The Cleric gets the three kinds of Divine Magic. The Sorcerer gets the four kinds of Elemental Magic. So this is your Flamethrower, your Lightning Slinger. The Cleric is your Heal Bot. Um, although, also, they do get some pretty good attack spells. Uh, so very much like, I think, in Dungeons & Dragons, when you hear the word Cleric, a lot of people think, oh, you know, that's your walking first aid kit. But secretly, if you really start looking, it's not hard to make the cleric into your boomstick. So um, this is the party that I usually go through the game with in terms of classes. Uh, but, you know, we can mix and match these faces. We can figure out, you know, if we want to stick with these classes or if we want to change the names or what have you. So um, let's get started. I think uh, Zoltan over here, he's probably my favorite. Um, and I will admit to, as... Uh, as a younger kid, probably had just a little bit of a crush on this character portrait. Uh, so, I, I'm probably, we're, we're going to keep him. And, um, oh, oh, I see. Y'all don't like paladins. That's fine. That's fine. Because um, if we have like something like a cleric, a sorcerer, and an archer, that is more than enough magic to carry the party if we made the paladin into a knight or something. Um, it's always nice to have two healers. The, the downside of the magic system here is that um, each type of magic, uh, of which there are nine has its own spell book of, I think, 12 spells. Uh, it might be 9 in Might and Magic 6 and 12 in later games, but I, th I think it's 10 or 12. Um, and so the only healing spells are in spirit and body magic. So if you only have one healer, that is pretty much all they're going to be doing. If you have two characters that can heal, then it spreads the load out a little bit more. Uh, oh, yeah, Zoltan can get it. 
Um, and Serena over here, I you can't see anything but their faces yet. When we actually get into the game, you'll see that um, they have full body portraits in their inventory screens. And I always thought that she looked kind of like Xena. Uh, warrior princess you know like in the face she's obviously not lucy lawless but like the way her hair is done and the armor that she's wearing the her base outfit uh very very xena-esque uh meanwhile heidi over here queen of the shepherd people um I, it's your default archer for some reason i don't know um but let's see let's let's start with uh these character portraits let's see we've got this guy Pick me. One-eyed dude who is very enthusiastic. Ready? This ugly fellow. Choose me. This kind of weird-looking Viking dude who's got a strangely, I guess, disproportionately soft voice. It's a little odd. Hey, choose me. And then we've got uh, Tommy Wiseau here. You gotta pick me. This is like Zoltan's slightly edgier first cousin. Me. Um, this is a guy who obviously, uh, I think, makes minimum wage impersonating Dwayne the Rock Johnson at parties. What's help you need? Choose me. There's Zoltan Choose again. Me. Okay, now, and she's into it. She's into it. She's here for this. She is. She is ready for adventure. I'm the one. Choose me. How about me? Uh, so Dar Darlene here. <laughs> she is some. Um, uh, she's something else. She's something else. She's coordinated though. I'm ready. I'm the one you want. And there we go. So. Okay. Um. All right. So let's see. We got to have Tommy Wiseau, I think, in the party. And choose me. You want ready? Choose me. Hey, choose. you got to Let's see. And how are we feeling about uh the blonde chick here who she looks like Carrie Underwood's mom. I'm just going to throw that out there. All right. And I think Zoltan is staying uh I, I try to keep kind of a balanced party. I'm into whatever, but I, I usually try to have like two ostensibly male and female characters. Um, so, are we feeling Xena here, or are we, like, what, Marsha? These names, though. Look, Zoltan, and then Marsha, Christine, Simon. Hmm. Oh, you're not into Marsha? But, I mean, look at Marsha. Marsha is in her late 40s. Uh, she's a heavy smoker, and she is a cougar. You can tell from the winged eyeliner up there and the, the color of eyeshadow she's picked out. Um, she's after Zoltan. She doesn't know that he's gay, but not for Tommy. She probably... Yeah, yeah, she is going to complain to the dungeon manager. Me. All right. Well, we can we can stick with Xena here. Okay. Well, let's see. Uh, all right. Let's name these people. So, um, the star of the star of the room dungeon edition over here. What are we calling this guy? Tommy. We got to vote for Tommy. All right. Thank you guys for playing along. And let's see. She... What does this chick look like? I feel like... Like, she's not quite a Karen. She's definitely not a Christine. Um... Oh, a Debbie? A uh, Debbie, 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 where are you? Let's see. I'm sorry, that's such an obscure joke. Um, I have to explain, way back in the probably early 2000s, late 90s, there was this commercial for something, and, and they were making fun of like uh, workplace team building exercises, and there was this brief shot where everyone in the accounting department or the office or whatever was all like on yoga mats doing stretches, and, and then it would cut to them trying to meditate. 
and they were talking, but find your happy place, find your happy place. You go, what do you see? I see a tree, and what do you see? Oh, I see a river, and then the the guy, like, and you can see the dude in, like, a ponytail and a fringe jacket, and he leans down and puts his hand on this, this one accountant's shoulder, and it's like, and Debbie, 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 where are you? And um, that's not that funny by itself, but once... Um, the station feed dropped and we got just the rainbow colored bars that some folks might remember uh, where there was no program on in the background. It was just kind of a we'll be right back on channel three sort of thing. And someone had left a mic on in the station and you could hear the station staff talking about the feed being down and they couldn't find it. And one guy close to the microphone was like, and Debbie, 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 where are you? And everybody started laughing and it was really funny. Um, Let's see. Yes, yeah, her full name, she's a Deborah. Um, but she goes by Debbie when she's out adventuring, I think. Let's see. Okay, Xena Warrior Mom over here. Um, what are we gonna call her? Let's let's move this along. I'm I'm reminiscing, I'm waxing nostalgic, but I'd rather be like I, I don't know, I don't have a joke there. I was gonna say waxing some monsters or something, but that sounds significantly less good out loud than it did in my brain. Let's see. <laughs> um, I'm feeling, I, let's see. She seems more adventurous. Like, Debbie seems lighthearted and fun. Like, she's... Debbie's a wine mom. This is, like... This is beer mom. Lucy. In honor of Lucy Lawless. The real Xena. And, let's see. Are we just gonna... How, how, do we, how are we feeling about Zoltan over here? Yes. Abs Lucy absolutely came to... Uh, she came to Dungeons and Dragons with a character already made. She is not here for your drawn out like group discussions about her backstory. She knows what she wants. Zoltan. Zoltan is the brains of the operation. It's true. Okay. All right. Now we need to figure out who these folks are. So, what class is Tommy gonna be? I feel like he doesn't really. He... I feel like he doesn't kick enough ass to be a knight or a paladin, um, but I don't know what else to make him. Okay, real world Tommy Wiseau is a druid. Well, I don't know that real world Tommy Wiseau is a druid. I don't know that I agree with that. I will say um, he does seem as though he would be very at home in the wilderness. So, okay, we can do a druid. We can do a druid. Um, and you'll see that the symbol for the druid uh, is a poorly rendered tree. So enjoy that. Okay. Um, oh, hi, tree. He did not hit it. He did not. Um, Debbie. What's Debbie doing? Where's Debbie at in life? Wine mom. Is wine mom an archer? Is she, is she going to be the cleric? Is she the one who picks us up? when we're down uh or does debbie is debbie secretly is she a party girl that's not a secret debbie's a party girl i feel like she's probably the one with the fire and lightning magic yeah yeah see we're on the same page she likes to she brings the fireworks debbie is the one who uh comes to the fourth of july cookout with the fireworks and then later in the year she comes to your memorial day cookout and she brings fireworks again even though it's illegal let's see lucy here um lucy i feel like lucy came to kick ass i kind of feel like lucy is our lucy's our ass kicker lucy's the muscle uh because tommy tommy's not helping Tommy's not helping. Debbie and Lucy are in charge of this party. They're the ones with the direction. Like Zoltan's the troubleshooter, but Debbie and Lucy are the respect of, respectively like the heart and and the loving arms. 
the strong embrace of the party. I feel like she could be a cleric. She'd make a good paladin. Uh, she could be a knight. Hmm. We feel like paladin? Paladin mom. Yeah. Yeah, I, f I feel like she could be a paladin. All right, and Zoltan. Okay, Zoltan by default is a sorcerer, which I feel is appropriate. It's hard to imagine him as anything else um, because I always play him as a sorcerer. I don't think I've ever made him a different class. So this this will be new for me if he is something else. Think he's a cleric? All right, so Zoltan... Um, yeah, Zolt Zoltan will be he'll 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 handle the healing. He he supports his his moms. Zoltan is very supportive of his moms. Um I don't know I feel like we've got kind of a family dynamic like like Debbie Debbie is kind of like in her her mid forties. She goes to theater group. Uh, she's she's like head of the local drama club. Uh, she drinks a lot of wine at sports bars and laughs too loud even when things aren't funny. But she's always there to pick you up when you're down. And Lucy over here, um, she you could call Lucy to help you change a tire at one in the morning, and she would never ask you any questions. She would just come and do it. Uh, but also, she will beat your ass if you owe her money. I think. And she she is very aggressive shopper in the grocery store, for sure. Zoltan, I feel like Zoltan's creative. He's a little shy. He blushes around cute boys. Maybe around cute girls, too. But uh, for sure, he's an animal lover, and he owns a lot of books. He owns a lot of books. Maybe one of those like really shitty traveling paint sets. Tommy? I don't know where Tommy fits into the family dynamic. Like, obviously, Debbie and Lucy are like Zoltan's moms. And they just want the best for him. I feel like Tommy is sort of like a hobo they picked up along the way. Like, like they started adventuring, and they, they went down the well in the, the opening cinematic, and Falagar rescued them, and Tommy was just kind of already at the bottom of the well... And Falagar was just as surprised as anybody else. And then he just kind of came with them when they went to become adventurers. And they can't get rid of him. He's kind of like a bed bug. Like, it only takes one of him. But even if you fumigate the whole apartment, you might not get him. That's Tommy. All right. Well, uh, it's a party, folks. So... First things first, you'll see here that there are two sections to each of these adventures sort of um, starting character sheets, and you've got your seven stats, your uh, your mipizel, might, intellect, personality, endurance, accuracy, speed, and luck, and then everybody's got their skills. Now, you start out with two skills that are determined by your class, and then you get to pick two more, um, and the pool down here that you can draw those two skills from is based on your class as well, because not every class can learn every skill. Um, Might Magic 6 doesn't allow every class access to every skill, but the rule is if you can get a skill, you can maximize it. Uh, you can reach the superlative rank with that skill. So um, I'm going to do what I generally do here, which is um, first thing I, gen I usually do, you've got 50 points to distribute. It costs one point, as you can see, to increase a stat. And I usually go over all of the stats that are less than 10 and bring them up to 10. Uh, because uh, you're going to need that at the beginning of the game just kind of to survive. That leaves you with 22 points based on this party, and then you kind of want to divide those amongst your different characters, and you want to sort of maximize whatever it is that they need to do what they're doing. Sorcerers have to have intellect. That's what their magic is based on. Uh, divine magic for like clerics and paladins, uh, they need personality instead. Um, obviously your fighters are going to need things like endurance, accuracy, speed, all the, the rest of that is, you know, is useful for everybody, but intellect and personality is really where it's at at the beginning of the game. 
Now, the the downfall of the druid is that because they cast both kinds of magic, they need both intellect and personality, as you can see from their point distribution here starting out. So uh, that's going to be a little bit rough to manage, but it's we'll get there. It only really matters at the beginning of the game. Um, I feel like uh, as the game goes on, uh, your stats kind of matter less and less. There we go. All right. That's pretty good. Um, so let's see. Let's start over here with Zoltan. So clerics start with uh, mace, so that they can equip and use maces effectively. And they start with body magic. Body magic is physical magic. So that's things like cure poison, healing, and they also get one of the best basic attack spells early on, which is called harm, uh, which just deals pure physical damage, almost like a weapon attack, and knocks the enemies backwards. Uh, not very far, but but some. So let's see. Uh, probably... See, this is where I, I play a little bit of risk-reward when it comes to choosing skills, because um, I'm a firm believer that putting points into a skill that you're not going to take to maximum level is a waste of those points. So you'll notice that like I'm not going to choose the leather armor skill for Zoltan, because clerics can wear chainmail. Um, there are three levels of armor in Might Magic 6, leather, chain, and plate, and then there's also shield, and then you got your various weapon stats, or uh, weapon skills, staff, dagger, sword, mace, um, axe, spear, bow. Um, so, um, he's already got mace. I think that that's fine. I'm going to give him shield to go with that, because uh, maces are one-handed, so he might as well have a shield in the other hand. But I'm going to skip leather. That's going to make him a little more vulnerable at the beginning, but we're going to pick up chain pretty early. And then, um, let's see. He needs another skill over here. Uh, he's got the highest personality in the group. We could give him diplomacy. Uh, that makes it a little bit cheaper to do things like hire NPC helpers. Uh, and then, of course, we could also take Spirit Magic or Mind Magic, which is, those are the other two Divine Magic skills. And getting one of these for free at the very beginning of the game is a big boon, because they Magic skills cost a lot to learn, and they kind of come slowly at the beginning of the game. Uh, later on, we'll have so much money that it won't matter. We won't know what to do with it. But at the beginning, we've got to play it conservative. Um, yes, Zoltan only wears leather when he's not on the job. He wears leather for fun, not when he's working. Let's see. Um, hmm. Meditation's also great because the meditation skill uh, just directly adds to your spell points. And what happens is as you ramp it up, it creates a multiplier. So it's really useful early on in the game. And because we've got two healers in the party, um, or two potential healers, I'm not going to give him meditation. I'm going to go ahead and give him... Spirit magic, I think. Now, our paladin here, Lucy, she starts with sword. Now, we could likewise give her shield. And she also, you'll see she's got leather and chain. We don't want to give her leather or chain because she can equip plate armor. There's no reason for her to have leather or chain if she's going to be wearing plate. So we want to get that as soon as possible, but we also don't want to waste a slot and put one of her free skills in leather or chain. I'm paladins. Paladins can be kind of rough. Um, the reason why is because there's so many good choices. But see, the ultimate ability of the sword skill is that you can dual wield, and so I hesitate to give her a shield as well. So I think what I'm gonna do is um, let's give her diplomacy. And either perception or disarming. We don't have an archer, but somebody needs to be watching out for the group. I, I think that's Lucy. I think we decided that, that Lucy is the one who, she's got an eye out for everybody else. So uh, she's going to have perception. And yeah, not diplomacy, actually. She's she's anger mom, angry. Um, I feel like... I feel like maybe Debbie. 
Maybe Debbie's got diplomacy. Yeah, I think Debbie's got diplomacy. And um, you'll notice here that uh, I'm, I'm kind of playing, I'm staying a little in character. Normally I would choose leather armor for her um, and probably one of the other magics because identify is very cheap to pick up. Um, instead, I'm going to forego leather in order to get one of the other elemental magic skills because they are way more expensive and that way she'll have more spell options at the beginning. Leather is a lot cheaper to pick up. So I'm gonna grab her water magic and we'll get into why I'm picking water magic a little bit later. And we'll go back over. She handles the dangerous tasks. We're gonna give her disarm. I think Lucy's the one who's gonna be uh, opening chests for us. She'll take the hit for the team. And Tommy. God. Tommy. <sighs> Tommy, Tommy, Tommy. Druids Druids are super rude because they are the only class that can pick up learning, I think, um, for free at character creation. Yeah, yeah, they're the only ones. Learning is a learning is a bullshit skill because what learning does is it multiplies the experience points that you gain so that you level up faster. And much like meditation, it's just a multiplier. So if you become an expert and then a master in it, uh, the bonus gets exponentially bigger. Um, I don't think Tommy's a fast learner. I think that Tommy probably needs leather armor because somebody has to have armor in this damn party and leather is that that's the best armor that druids can wear they can't wear chain or plate so there's no reason for him not to take leather and he's got kind of a mishmash of skills where he could choose spirit body water so forth so on um he can learn both healing magic and attack magic because he's a druid. So he's going to be casting a lot of spells and he's useless at anything else. That's what a druid does. They're just for spells, which means that SP is a big deal for him. So I think probably I'm going to go ahead and give him meditation. Um, nah, well, you know what? Meditation's so cheap to pick up. Actually, actually let's give, let's give Tommy body magic. Because, you know what, he claims he did not hit her, but, uh, he's gonna. He's gonna. He's gonna. And we also know, Tommy, absolutely, I, I see you suggesting the repair skill. And, uh, Tommy can't fix shit. So Tommy does not get the repair skill. We'll give that to somebody else later. We'll figure it out. Alright, so here we go. Tommy the Druid... Uh, with staff, earth magic, body magic, and leather armor. Debbie, Debbie the wine mom sorcerer with daggers, fire and water magic, and diplomacy. Lucy the paladin, angry mom, with swords, spirit magic, perception, and disarm trap. And Zoltan the cleric uh, with his mason shield, his body magic, and spirit magic. All right, kids. Well... Let's do this. Here we go. I love that loading screen, by the way. Okay, so first things first, I'm going to put it into turn-based mode. And I don't want anybody to jump because this sound is kind of like... It can be loud and startling. So, uh, watch out. Here it comes. And I know that like that's kind of quiet for you because of how I have my sound set up. Um, but that sound has made people jump in the past when I was playing this game with other people. So I always like to warn folks. All right, so here we are. Here's our little window that we have to look out at the world at. Um, you see our, our little stop hand there means that we're in turn-based mode. Um, I'm generally going to go through combat in turn-based mode, just out of habit. You can stay in real-time mode all the time. Um, but turn-based is how I learned to play the game. It's how I still play the game. So for preference, I feel like it gives you more tactical control. So here's our auto map. Lovely. This indicates the time of day, and you'll see on our bar right here all of our messages. Anything I hover over is going to appear here. You can see that it's daytime, 
It's morning Monday. It's New Year's Day, 1165. And I love that they use the same days of the week and months that we use. Um, here are our indicators of what the characters can perceive in the world. If this jewel is green, the characters feel safe. If it is yellow, they sense danger or they feel unsafe. If it is red, they know that danger is there even if you don't. So these are a great indicator of whether or not you're safe to rest, of whether there's a monster nearby. And you can kind of use it to cheese a little bit because you can do things like sense monsters behind hidden panels and walls and so forth. Um, here's our hit point bar. Here's our spell point bar. And you can see 20 of 20, 25 of 25, and so on and so forth. And then we've got our spell books. We've got our resting bar. We've got our quick reference, which kind of gives us a glance at the screen we were just looking at a moment ago. Like, here's their bonus to hit, uh, which is terrible. Here's a, approximately how much damage they do. Uh, here's their range attack modifier, the damage for that, skills, and so forth. Quick spells condition. We'll visit this screen off and on, but not all the time. And I'm going to go ahead and... Make sure my controls are set up properly. We got smooth turning on. Awesome. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and we're going to save this game. And we're going to call this Twitch Family Robinson. Oh, it doesn't fit. Okay, well, that's fine. All right. And then these little books right here, uh, above the f amount of food we have, which you use during resting, and the amount of gold we have, which you spend on stuff, these books are all of our records. This is our calendar. Shows the phase of the moon and so forth, which can sometimes... Ah, Enroth! That's the other one. I always forget. Erothia is on the other side of the world, across the ocean. Enroth is this kingdom. Um, here is our map, where we can zoom in and out and so forth. These are our auto notes. Uh, the game keeps things like potion recipes we discover, uh, the magical effects of fountains, and yes, every body of water from which you can drink has some sort of weird enchantment. Um, obelisks, which are a holdover from the strategy version of the game, Heroes of Might and Magic. Um, all of the obelisks have a riddle attached to them. If you collect them all, then uh, you can find a secret super treasure buried somewhere, uh, which if you go there at the proper time and dig it up, it has a treasure chest full of like artifact level equipment and so on. Uh, the Seer's Notes, and then this is just miscellaneous stuff, like things we've learned about quests, or they'll tell us where like trainers are. Um, so if we hear from someone that so-and-so in the town of such-and-such -such teaches uh, expert archery, that will be recorded in this tab. And then these are our current quests. You can see that we need to go to uh, the, well, it doesn't tell us, but somewhere here in Nusorpagal, uh, Andover Potbello is waiting to get Solomon's letter from us. And since we have somehow wound up with Solomon's letter, um, we're going to give that to him and get a reward, and he doesn't know that we're not on his side. So here is our character screen. We've got our character records, our skills, our inventory, our awards, which is things like uh, major quests we've completed, guilds we've joined, and then of course we can click out. So here's Debbie. We were right about Debbie. Debbie is fun. And uh, <laughs> Debbie's Debbie came, she heard that there is a party and, and that's why she's here. Uh, Lucy, there you go. Like I said, Xena, warrior princess. Uh, someone was looking straight at Lucy Lawless's costume when they drew this. And if it's not quite a copy-paste, but it might as well be. Zoltan, a little more practically dressed. Um, the stripes, I feel, very bold choice. Also, not a fan of his shoes, but this top, though. I mean, where did you get that? Uh, I want one. And Tommy. Tommy Tommy continues to be paradoxically the worst no matter which way you're looking at him. Um like ev everything about Tommy is somehow worse than everything else about Tommy. Any individual thing that you pick out is just the worst thing. Um I just, I don't know. Oh, and also, I don't know, this is a fun thing. This is one of my favorite little details, and it really only matters right during character creation or at the very beginning of the game, so I'm going to point it out now. Notice our experience up here is not zero. 
Tommy has 276 experience points to start out with. Now, I don't know if that's determined by your like a combination of your class and stats, perhaps, but w whatever algorithm is in the background of the game that awards you experience points at the beginning, I guess this is maybe representative of Falagar's training? Like, this is what you have left over from, like, the how you got to first level from being a zero-level nobody. Uh, but also, it's not the same. Notice she's got 339, 323, and 293. Appropriately, they have the most. Uh, but, and, and, and appropriately, Tommy has the least. But, um, yeah. Yeah. So, that's a thing. All right, let's get this party started. All right, so you start with equipment in your inventory kind of based on whatever skills you picked. So since he chose leather armor, he starts with a suit of the most basic leather armor that you can get. And we're going to go ahead and throw that on. And also, he's got this incredibly shitty club. Uh, and I love that the game even, like, it gives it to you for free, and you'll find these everywhere, but the game kind of chastises you for using it. Like, you're not thinking of using this, are you, as your weapon? So instead, we're going to use this amazing staff. Uh, we'll give that to her. And sometimes, you get everyone gets a free ring. Sometimes, randomly, the rings will have kind of a crappy enchantment on them. Not all the time. And uh, because he started with Earth Magic for free, he gets the very first Earth Magic spell. Yes. And he loves, he enjoyed learning that. And uh, because we gave him body magic, likewise, he gets the first most basic body magic spell for free. Okay. You're not responsible enough to have quest items. You don't get to carry those. Okay. Uh, our collection of clubs continues to grow. Let's see, here's her ring. Okay, it's a different kind, but it's still not magical. Uh, here's flame arrow for her because water magic and fire magic, yes. cold beam. Um, this is fun. There is alchemy in the game. You can find these empty potion bottles all over the place, and you'll find different reagents that you can turn into potions. So, Ferna Root is used to make the most basic um, SP restorative potion, so it recovers your magic. You just pick this up with L, hover over an empty potion bottle, and right-click to mix the potion. We'll hang on to that there. And uh, this will also be recorded over here in our auto notes. So every time we discover a new potion recipe, there it will be. Alright, likewise, here we go. It worked. This is Poppy Snaps. Poppy Snaps, um, they cure weakness, I think. Oh, no, okay, this is the one, the most basic yellow potion's energy potion. Uh, temporarily plus 10 to all stats, which is pretty useful at the beginning of the game. Bless. Yes. Bless is such a good spell at the beginning, and later on as well, because it gives everyone increased accuracy. And your accuracy sucks at the beginning. Okay, he's got first aid from body magic and bless from spirit yes. magic. And his ring is also not magical. That's unusual. I think that might be the first time I've ever actually started a game and had all of them be non-magical. Interesting. And here's Solman's letter. Now, if we just right-click on this item, we're going to get a description of it. But if we pick it up with left-click and come over here and then left-click mm -hmm. and hold, you hear her, hmm, in the background. And uh, she's actually going to be able to read the entire thing. So, um, yeah, this letter to Solman is from someone named Xenofex. And he's ordering Solman to go to New Sorpagal, stay out of sight and wait for further instructions. Uh, this actually ties into the story of Heroes of Might and Magic 3, uh, which also happens concurrently with Might and Magic 7. I know sometimes that can be difficult to keep track of. Um, but Xenofex has uh, Queen Catherine's father, the King of Arathia, um, assassinated. So she gets called back to Arathia to basically deal with his affairs, and then a war happens and keeps her from coming home. Uh, meanwhile, here, King Roland, who is one of the heroes of Heroes of Might and Magic 2, um, he's the king of Enroth, and he married Catherine in order to unite the two kingdoms, and so while she's gone to Arathia, uh, he had to take care of some stuff here, and he's been kidnapped. So... That means that uh, the regent 
Wilbur Humphrey is currently running the kingdom, uh, which is a shame because people are starting to like lose confidence in the Iron Fist family, which is Roland. So, all right, all that said, um, oh, you know what I'm going to do? Can we controls? Oh, we can't change it. Okay. I was going to change WASD, but uh, yeah, so <laughs> if you are right-handed, this game can be a pain in the ass to play because um, you have to use the arrow keys. So, yeah. All right. So this is Might and Magic 6. Let's, uh, let's dive in. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to go right over here to the stables. See the little horse symbol there. Um, and here, we're going to pick up these horseshoes. Horseshoes are very important because horseshoes give you two free skill points when you use them on a character. So we're going to save those, and we're going to give those to people who need them. And here in the well, uh, it's refreshing. Refreshing, so refreshing. It's because our luck skill's not high enough yet. This fountain restores five hit points. This one is five spell points. And this one is plus ten might temporarily. So that's great. Now we're going to head into the tavern here. A lonely night. And here is our contact. Solman never shows up in the game. I think maybe he's been disposed of prior to the beginning of our quest. Uh, and I'm not sure exactly how we wound up with Solman's letter, but basically we talked to this fool. And, huh, oh yeah, bah, friend. You know, that'll, I'll explain that later. Um, but you'll see here, he is interested in the letter. We show him the letter, and uh, he gives us a thousand gold. And it's because he all he knows about his contact is that they're supposed to have a certain seal on the letter, Xenofex's seal. Uh, he doesn't actually know who Solman is or to expect a specific person. So he's going to give that money to us, and he's also going to give us a quest. Uh, he wants us to do the Temple of Ba of Favor. Now, the Temple of Ba are bad guys. They're a cult that's been spreading throughout Enroth. We'll deal with them a lot as the uh, quest continues. Um, there's a temple here to Ba, and uh, they have a candelabra that they left behind when they evacuated the place in a hurry, which isn't suspicious at all. And so he wants us to bring it back to him, and he'll give us a reward if we do. Um, now... In most buildings, you will find at least one person to whom you can speak. I apologize for, like, I, it was a different time, I guess, and the word had not gotten around to the developers at 3DO and New World Computing that this is a, the G word is a racial slur, so I, I apologize. But um, they will tell you various little, you know, bits and pieces of trivia about the world. Um, you know, they'll mention, like, the schedules of stables and so forth. And of course, from the shopkeepers, you can actually purchase stuff. You can buy skills and what have you. Um, stables take you to other locations so that you don't have to walk there. And if you purchase passage to a, another town map, it also doesn't cost you food. So I guess that, like, this includes lunch. We've got our general store where you can buy things like potion bottles and so on. Uh, we've got our blacksmith who sells weapons, our armor smith, which is self-explanatory. Uh, this is the bank. Um, you can put money in the bank. It does not draw interest, but it does keep it safe because if you die, you will respawn, but it costs you all the gold you are currently carrying. Any money stashed in the bank, death doesn't steal from you for some reason. Whoa! Hi there. Uh, and this is the town hall. The town hall... It's only open from 10 a.m. to 9. Well, it'll be open in a few minutes. Um, the town hall will give you various quests, and also they'll give you bounties. Um, this is... <sighs> Hi. 
Uh, bounties are uh, mini quests. They want you to kill a specific monster and come back and tell them that you did it within a certain date window or calendar window, and if you do, they'll give you money. It's a great way to earn cash if you feel like being somebody's step and fetch it for murder. All right, so... This will be important later. Um, this isn't a quest yet, but... It's kind of like a hidden quest. Uh, we get certain clues later on in the game. We can come back and mention them to him, and we'll get rewarded for it. This is the quest he actually gives us. Um, he's interested in us rescuing Sherry Carnegie, a healer who is beloved by the townspeople. So uh, we'll go find her later. Janice here, who is my favorite town clerk, um, <laughs> says that we get all of our important shipments in on Tuesdays. Uh, the current bounty hunt is an archer, which uh, we'll see if we find one of those. And if we do, they'll give us 900 gold for killing them. Uh, but this is why we're really here. See, she says just south of, uh, south of town, there's an old fortress called Goblin Watch that was built to keep the town safe from goblin raids. But they basically haven't maintained it because everything's been so peaceful. And so, of course, they're super embarrassed to find out that goblins moved into the keep. And they changed the lock. So they're offering 2,000 gold pieces if we will take the key to Goblin Watch and go clear all the goblins out. Now, these other houses back here, um, they're not... Some of them are things like, uh, for example, Blade's End. This is a guild. You can learn skills from there. Um, but most of these houses are just private residences. And a lot of these folks, they'll give you the trivia... But they'll also give you a quest, and they'll let you join these guilds, so that that way we can benefit from them. Because if you're not a member of a guild, you cannot purchase anything from them. Uh, oh yeah, she wants us to rescue Angela. Thank you. You're too kind. And now you can see that the quests are starting to pile up a little bit. <laughs> so uh, Angela's in the abandoned temple. Um, which where we always ha already have to go anyway in order to get the candelabra. Um, and also that other fellow, Buford, Buford T. Allman, he wants us to kill the Spider Queen. How are you? Uh, and here we go. Now it begins. Um, I love Debbie's Cockney accent. Um, this fellow will teach us expert meditation if we have at least four ranks in meditation. But you'll see here, for a fee of 500 gold, he'll help you attain expert rank but you have to be rank 4. And then this should be added to our notes. Norio Araganaka is uh, the master of meditation. So um, you have to kind of find the expert teachers of skills on your own, but an expert teacher will always tell you where the master of their skill is located, so that way it's added to your notes. And uh, in this game, there are only two levels of skills, expert and ma uh, master. And each one of those does something to improve the function of the skill. Bodybuilding is the physical version of meditation. It gives you hit points instead of SP. How are you today? We're going to join Blades Thank in you. for 25 gold. How are you? Ah, this guy, he'll purchase cobra eggs from us if we find any. Thank you. You're too kind. And we will find some. Right now, I'll just kind of show off the layout of the town. Oh, I almost forgot. Up here. You can actually go up behind the tavern here. And there's a house up here. This is expert perception. Lucy will need that later. And this one should be, yes, identification expert. Identification allows you to, of course, identify unidentified items, which when you pick them up will be green. And uh, you don't know what they do. April the Navigator. All these folks that are wandering around out here um, in the overworld are actually NPCs with whom you can interact. Heidi the Surf. <laughs> I made a Heidi joke and now there she is. Uh, let's see. This is Heather the Trapper, Gwen the Trader, Ives the Arms Master, uh, Cynthia the Healer. And so, oh, 
Now see, How are you? this is going to be really important. This is our real first quest. Before we do anything else, um, I'm going to show you a little something. It's the only real Easter egg or, or hidden thing in the game that I know about. Um, and that is, there is a whole hidden level that you can access here in New Sorpagal at the very beginning, uh, and it's totally worth it to do it. But in order to pull it off, you really need a Gate Master. And the reason you need a Gate Master is because what a Gate Master does is she casts the Town Portal spell at Master Ranking once per day. Now, she costs 2,000 gold to hire and 20% of all gold we find. That is unfortunate. Um, but it's worth it if we can afford her. So even though we just spent a bunch of money, yes, I know, uh, but still, um, we're going to need to come up with 1,050 gold as quickly as we can because we need Sharon or someone like her in our party. Let's see. So, what does that mean? Well, that means that our first quest is to come up with some cash. Let's see, it's 1051. I think that means that the alchemist shop should be open. Can I help you find anything? I love Wilma the Alchemist. All right, we're going to sell all of this crap. Now, you'll see, you can only sell certain things to certain people. General store owners will buy almost anything, but they buy it at a reduced price. Um, alchemists will buy things like accessories, potions, and so forth. Um, and of course they also won't buy, like, quest items. Um, but otherwise, like, I'll have to go over and sell these to the weapon shop guy. Hmm. And you'll see here, because we don't have the merchant skill, so we're getting taken in. This ring is worth 300 gold, even without any enchantments on it. But she'll give us, yawn, 85, I guess. We'll just have to take what we can get for now. But we're well on our way. There we go. We've already turned a small profit on what we just sold, or what we just spent a moment ago. He'll give us one gold for these measly clubs. Alright. Now let's see. Okay. We are going to set up All right. ready spells. Yes. Our healers here, um, I'm going to set them up with... Okay. healing spells rather than attack spells um, so that that way I'm not constantly clicking in when I need to heal because it will happen a lot at the beginning. Um, but otherwise, here we go. Now we'll get to see some combat. And I'm not ashamed to save spam. It, it is what it is. Alright, this is the Guild of Self. This is where they sell divine spells. Um, there's our first enemies. Those are some goblins up there, and I don't know what they're doing on top of this guild or why they're allowed to be up there, but there they are. So, you'll see our jewels here are yellow. We're going to go up here. Up the back way. Oh, now they're red. Let's, uh, let's fight some goblins. Oh, let's see, she's already been hit around the corner. Combat in this game is, um... <laughs> it's, uh... It's a little wonky. We're going to take advantage of that sometimes to cheese a fight, but also sometimes it's going to come back to bite us. Okay, first things first. Here's a goblin. And you just click to attack, or you can hit the A button. Uh, you'll notice that um, this is a goblin shaman. They look kind of similar. That's because every enemy in the game appears in three different palette swaps. Uh, so there will be three different levels, a weakest version, a middling version, and a strongest version, which in their case is the Goblin King, uh, who is this guy but red. And they'll have different abilities, but appearance-wise, they're all going to look the same. And they're these interesting sort of 2D, 3D models superimposed on a fully 3D world. It's a little weird. Um, but what matters is we can see this guy to click on him. Now, for spells, you might need to have line of sight. Some, Not all spells, but a lot of spells, you have to actually be able to shoot them. And by default, the spell doesn't go where your cursor is. Uh, it just aims for the center of the character model. But if all you're doing is hitting someone with a stick, 
you just have to be able to see them. And if you can see to click, no matter how tiny, well, then you can hit them. So this goblin's dead, and this this is one of my favorite parts of the game. The body stays there, it's persistent, because if you click on it, we're going to loot that corpse. So let's get busy. We're going to let them come to us if we can. Aha, here we go. See, this is all we need. And another one bites the dust. Now, if they're far enough around a corner, they won't be able to hit us because technically they can't see us. Um, but as long as we can see any part of them, we can hit them. Oh, also, enemies that are too badly wounded, uh, they will run away from you. And if they don't have a ranged attack, that means that they will stop attacking you. Uh, now, like, the goblin shamans actually can cast Firebolt, and so they will stop and kind of shoot back at you uh, as they run away. But the regular goblins, they don't have an attack like that, so they're SOL. Oh, yes. Oops, <laughs> wrong way. There we go. You can look up and down in this game, which is pretty cool. Um, I say pretty cool. I mean, back in the 90s, I guess it was pretty cool. Sometimes you'll just find chests and things out in the world. And uh, when you do, there's no reason not to loot them. Now, this is where some of our skills come into play. Some of them are self-explanatory. You know, leather allows you to wear leather armor, gives you some other benefits. Earth magic lets you cast earth spells and makes you better at it as it levels up. Staff lets you use staves. These miscellaneous skills are a little bit more complicated. They do more esoteric stuff, like diplomacy reduces the reputation cost of interacting with NPCs. Um... The perception and disarm trap skills are very important, and they do... Perception functions largely automatically. It allows you to notice things like traps and secret doors out in the world. And also, if you get damaged by a trap, perception reduces the damage that you take and the negative effects that you suffer. Those parts of perception are automatic. Disarm trap is also automatic, but you have to have a specific character chosen for it to do anything. What that means is that since uh, since Lucy here has got Disarm Trap, we have to be using Lucy. She has to be the active character in order for that skill to mean anything. If Debbie opens this crate and there's a trap on it, then Lucy's Disarm Trap skill doesn't mean Jack. And just in case this is trapped. Ah, oh, it's not good. All right, now we're racking up the cash. Now see, these items, when we pick them up, they're green because we don't know what they are. They could be magic, maybe they're not, we're not sure. What we do know is that's a better shield than the one he has, and that's a better hammer than that mace that he has. I don't know. That scroll of some kind of spell, a ring of some sort, and a ferna root. Awesome, so we're already almost up to 1,600 gold. Uh, now, really quickly, I'm going to go ahead, and even though these are unidentified, you can still use them. You just don't know what their properties are. So, let's see, he is the only one with a shield. We're going to give that to him. They remain green to show you that you don't know what they are. Um, but you can cheese it just a little bit. This is how you get to your accessories screen, by the way. Gauntlets, necklace, six rings. Now, this ring is unidentified. If I click stats after I've picked it up, it stays on my cursor. I can bring it over here and I can drop it on there to equip. And if there are any changes to her stats, I'll see them on this character sheet change in real time. Now, just because there's no change happening doesn't mean this ring isn't magic because there are a few enchantments in the game that don't directly affect your stats. For example, SP regeneration, HP regeneration, poison resistance is like over here, you know, actually a thing like magic resistance, electricity resistance, those are numbers, so they're going to show up. But disease resistance is not on here. So being resistant to a specific status effect such as disease, petrification, paralysis, fear, they're not going to show up as stats on your stat sheet, which means this ring could be magic. 
but we don't know. Uh, another way to kind of gauge that is that um, when you go to sell it to a shopkeep, they know more about it than you do, and they know more than they let on. So even if it's unidentified to you, they may recognize that it's still a magical ring, and that will show up, it'll be reflected in the price that they're offering you. So we know that that ring before was purchased for something like 28 gold. So that means that if we take it back and we are offered something like 35 gold or 78 gold, then it could be a magic ring. <laughs> oh, 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 he did hit him. See, they're too far away for their melee weapons because they don't have ranged attacks other than spells. So we've got to play this kind of close to our chest, at least to start out. They're not doing a lot of damage, but we don't want to die and have to load it. Oh, Zoltan over there is in the yellow. That's okay. First aid. I really love how if you look very closely at their character portraits when they cast spells, um, a character's eyes usually sort of light up or their pupils will glow to indicate that they're using magic. I also like how Debbie wrinkles her nose at that. Uh, let's see. Debbie's a sorcerer. She can do better than this. Let's try a spell. There we go. That was too easy. Uh, oh. No, we don't want to heal him. Let's see. Magic arrow. <sighs> Thanks for nothing, Tommy. Okay, well now I can't be mad. Debbie didn't kill him either. Well, oh, this little guy's a tough one. There we go. Alright, now we're gonna go back real quick. Oh, <laughs> also this. forgot about this well. Alright, plus two luck for everybody permanently. There's more than four charges in here. We're going to give the rest of them to her. There we go. It has to do kind of with like, um, it'll give you plus two luck permanently if your luck is under a certain amount. So, but we want her to have the highest luck because she is our disarm trap person so and now these fountains do recharge like every uh, I think they recharge every 24 hours but that gives you at the beginning um, since you don't have that many hit points or spell points a lot more staying power you can just go back and heal for free and you don't have to like waste a trip staying at the inn or something alright we love cash we are almost to where we can hire Sharon. This should do it. Also, this is a much better club. It's still not as good as the hammer that he just found, but it's better than, you know, a stick with a nail in it, I guess. And notice here, their, their jewels kind of turned a little bit yellow there for a second. That wasn't because they sense danger from the crates. That's because there's actually a hidden event here where if you go over this bridge... I think it's this one. Maybe. No. Oh, no, it's the other one. Yeah, if you go over that bridge, you actually can get ambushed. Oh, there's some Widow's Weep. You'll see a lot of herbs lying around. Sometimes you'll find other items. You'll, you'll even find weapons or gold just lying on the ground. Um, but I never turn down free herbs. All right. We've got our 2,000 gold. Let's go find Sharon. Because at the moment, we don't really need that gold for anything else other than buying equipment. There's Sharon the Gate Master. How are you today? Okay. Now we have Sharon. I'm going to save that just to... Make sure you'll see me save spam a lot, uh, and I don't care. I, like I said, I'm, I'm not ashamed to save spam. That is because, uh, you know, I just, I, I don't want to have to go through a bunch of this again, especially live on stream. All right, so here's our Easter egg. I'll get to why we need Sharon in the first place. Obviously, since she's a gate master, it's because we're going to need to teleport somewhere. Let's see. Where 
is it? Oh, where is it? I know I have the right building. Ah, there we go. <laughs> so, yeah, hidden in the wall of the bank is this scroll. This is a scroll of fly. Um, why is that important? Well, other than just being an awesome spell, um, it's going to allow us to get somewhere that we really shouldn't be right now. All right, so now we're flying. Um, you'll see a little indicator right here, the little boots with wings on. That shows that uh, the fly spell is currently active. And here's where our status effects go for things like spells. We right click that, it'll show us that we've got it for five hours. That's not a long time, but it's enough to do what we need to do. And then I'm going to just kind of jet up in the air here. And you'll see them kind of become active. They're static when you're not using it. But when, it's, when you're actually flying, they flap a little bit. And that's because we need to be here. Oh. <laughs> Dummy me. Oops. I forgot. Let me explain something. Uh... <laughs> See that over there? That's a dragon tower. It's called that because what it does is it shoots f giant fireballs at anything that flies over a town. It's meant to defend the town from dragons. Um, there's actually a quest later where we need to adjust the settings of the dragon towers so that they will not shoot at person-sized targets. Right now, that's not how they're set, and until we get way further on in the main plot, we won't be able to do that. So, um, I, I kind of forgot about that. That's alright, though. Okay. There we go. Let's see, where is it? Uh, maybe it's on this side. I'll just jump over here. Ah, here we go. Now, we're dead, but I just want you to see why. <laughs> I didn't move quick enough. I did that partially on purpose because I wanted you to see all of the fucking dragons. <laughs> so, what we're doing here um, is we're going to use the fly scroll um, and... Uh, We're going to teleport to a place called Dragon Sand. There we go. Now, these guys are not something that we want to fight right now. Um, and you'll see we're kind of in the middle of nowhere, and there's no way out. This is why we need Sharon. It's to get home. Now, the first thing we're going to do, however is, you'll notice when I hover over this obelisk, it says Shrine of the Gods. Ta-da! Plus 20 to everything permanently. We're going to get that for every character. And then I'm going to save it. Just to make sure. So... That portal in New Sorbigal, that, that hidden easter egg in the wall, teleports us here just outside of the Shrine of the Gods in Dragon Sands. Hidden in the Shrine of the Gods in the wall is another portal. Um, where are we? Good question, Tommy. I'll tell you where we are. Welcome to uh, the New World Computing Offices. That's the company, of course, that made the game. And uh, so this is where they did it, I guess. Now, this is the exit. If we leave the building, um, we will go back out somewhere that we do not want to be. Um, here's an elevator to take us up to the second floor. We're just going to take the stairs. This place is loaded 
with all kinds of treasure. And, check this out. I love this because the programmers, the developers, kind of inserted themselves into the game as these NPCs. And they don't really do anything. Uh, they You can't hire them and take them with you or anything like that. Um, but you can explore this area. Like, here's their little office cubicle farm. Um, and there is all kinds of stuff um, around here. You just have to find it. Bruce Miyake. I'm going to open up some of these other side offices so you can see what I'm talking about. Here we go. See, there's just gold on the floor. 422. Now notice it says followers take 84. She's taking 20% of everything that we find, at least in terms of cash. There we go. This box just gives you, like, random herbs. Um, thank you, Bonnie Longhemsath backslash, for some reason. Um, but mostly... Uh, it's going to be okay even if she does take 20% because we're going to get so much. And in this area, we're going to find not only cash, we're also going to find some items. We're going to get some gear upgrades that are going to help us out. And see, this was uh, Felon Sykes. Uh, this is uh, Lou Henderson. Each of these offices actually corresponds presumably to... Um, the uh, the real office location in the building of a specific person. Here is like I guess the conference room. Ah, uh, here's an amulet. Now since nobody has air magic, we don't have the wizard eye spell, which is really handy for finding things lying around on the ground. It will point out treasures and stuff. We're just gonna have to use our actual eyes. No air magic. Uh, but anyway, it's just kind of neat to find these folks around here and I, I want to give a shout out to in case any of them were ever for some reason to see this um, to all of the folks who made this great game uh, that I still enjoy after all this time that I enjoy so much sharing with other people I'm glad y'all are here today to, to do that with me and so you know to Anthony Rizzo and, and was this John Gibson Ken Thompson all of these people who made this game are in this game um, and I mean Yes, we could go through here, and you can attack these people, and you can destroy them utterly. But I've never done that. And we're not going to do it now. Here we go. Aha! A box of cloaks. There's one for each of us. We'll go ahead and equip those. Uh, here's a much better staff. This know. is a second tier staff for Tommy here. Oh, I don't know. Better sword. Why not? And these actually are come identified. So this is the second tier cloak, I think. Gives us a little bit of an armor boost. Are you okay there, Lisa? Miss Ms. Whitman? Okay, well, we're going to leave Ms. Whitman to it. Uh, here we go. Some cash. A sword in the bookshelf. A dagger in the bookshelf. A sword in the bookshelf. A club in the bookshelf. You'll see I'm looking around as I go, not just for treasure, but also notice our jewels are yellow. There's a funny reason why that will be explained momentarily. All right, Dave, my man. All right, now we're finding some good stuff. Okay. This is like second or third tier boots. So what I'll do is I'll really quickly check to see who has the lowest AC, and I'll give it to them. Okay, it's one of our girls here. I'm going to give it to Lucy. She's already carrying it anyway. But yeah, these are armored boots. Boost her AC a little bit. Oh, my goodness gracious. Yes. Uh, this is, I think, third or fourth tier chainmail. 
That's uh, it's not quite end game chainmail, but it's almost end game chainmail. So as soon as we get her the chain skill, that'll be a nice big boost for Lucy. Uh, it doesn't look like there's anything in that one. Oh, you can you might hear the grunting in the background. Uh, that is because of the thing that's making our um, our jewels yellow. Oh, free cash. There we go. Now we've made back all of the money that we spent, all the money we spent on Sharon, all the money she's going to take from us, and also um, then some. And I also, because that adds directly to that, and it's not money we picked up off the ground or from an enemy, I'm not sure that she gets a cut of it, which is pretty cool. Okay, there's that other door. A little confusing. Okay, that one. It's one of those where, like, it shuts one as you open the other. Oh! Now, notice everyone... <laughs> you can see how folks are terrified suddenly. Um, they have the Afraid status, and Afraid is pretty good because what it does is it decreases your intellect, your personality, and your accuracy, but it actually increases your speed and your strength. Um... And I thought I like that actually. I've always thought that was kind of realistic. Like, yeah, uh, I'm not thinking straight, I'm not hitting straight, but I am. I'm running a lot faster, and if you get in my way, I'm going to run you over. Why are they afraid when they enter this room? You may have seen this guy's name in really big letters at the beginning of the game's cinematic opening. John Van Kanigam is the guy who invented Might and Magic. And unlike these innocent folks out here in the office uh, who make our jewels green and who count as innocents, so we don't want to kill them, um, Mr. Van Kanigam here uh, is... Uh, He's okay. He's okay to kill. <laughs> and uh, I, I love that they put that in there. Honestly, it's it's pretty good. Uh, get used to these faces. You're going to see them like that for a while. The fear will wear off. There we go. Now, it looks like our stats went down. That's because they did. When you click on this box, it gives us almost three days worth of the following spells. See, Lucky Day, Meditation, Precision, Speed, and Power. Some of those increase our stats right here. So that's why it looked like we lost hit points and SP. We actually didn't. What happened was our maximums increased so much that our current dropped down in proportion to match it. So... That's the fear spell kicking in again. This whole area is triggered for that so that when you walk past it, it gives you a fresh dose of fear. But then when you leave, so it's, I love that. Like, when you go into his office, you're terrified, but when you leave his office. So it's like the boss apparently scared everybody, I guess. I'm sure it's just a joke, but uh, it's, it's a good one. That makes me chuckle every time. Oh my god, where's all the stuff on the floor? There's supposed to be so much more treasure here. Ah, here we go, some. Potions for sale. Now these, so you'll notice it took some gold, it actually bought some. That's because this is like the vending room, this is I guess the break room. The pantry. Ooh. Uh, oops. It's alright. He got some bad food and his poison, but we also got some good food and uh... Let's see. We'll take care of that. This should work. Okay, so red berries or reagents make a cure wounds potion. And let's see. Blue and yellow. It worked. Make resistance. Red and yellow. It worked. Make protection. And success. Blue and red it worked. make cure poison, so it's not a big deal. Uh, he's still drunk, though. We'll get a few extra bottles, just so we don't have to buy those later. 
And uh, Rob King, are you still on break, man? He's never at his desk. Here we go. This is what I like to see. And we'll do an inventory check here in a little bit after we've uh, cleaned out some of this so that I'm not constantly clicking in and, and checking all of it. Nothing in this one. What about here? Sometimes you have to kind of back up and turn around and check because of the, the funny angles. I want to make sure that we actually are covering everything. I don't leave anything behind. I think we're mostly good so far. That's Van Kanigam's office. Let's go in here. Nothing. Now I will say this. Oh! <laughs> Reflex. Um, this is Trip Hawkins. You notice that he is a Goblin King, whereas John Van Kanigam uh, was a Goblin Shaman. Um, I'm not 100% sure, but I believe that's because John Van Kanigam was like uh, the lead developer for Might and Magic and the creative director. Trip Hawkins, I think, is actually the CEO of New World Computing, so he outranks John Van Kanigam a little bit. But uh, not enough that we can't buy some peace for these poor beleaguered office workers. There we go. Another conference room, I think. Back to the cloakroom. Check a couple of these offices that we missed. And um, I should mention, I was about to say this before old Trip tripped us up. Um, uh, cause Trip Hawkins, yeah, he, yes, he founded, uh, 3DO and I think Electronic Arts. So, so honestly, I don't feel bad about killing him since he founded EA. Um, I'm just, you know, it's, I'm sure it's fine. It evens out somewhere. Oh, there's some money. But, uh, yeah... Uh, I am. I, I should mention that I am playing with a patch. Um, it's not a major patch, but it does make a few adjustments to the game, and I don't remember off the top of my head what all of them are. Uh, it was mostly like graphical stuff, um, and I think that by default, the hidden scroll in the wall of the bank might actually be um, maybe a scroll of jump instead of a scroll of fly and so you have to aim a little more carefully to get up on top and I think that it just the patch maybe makes it easier by making it a scroll of fly um, among a few other things and so one of the things that it could have changed and the reason I'm not seeing as much treasure as I'm used to in New World Computing um, is because it might reduce the amount of treasure that's here since they make it easier to get to that's the trade-off uh, but it's okay. I'm not upset because it's still cool. We still got Buku money, and honestly, uh, the chainmail and stuff by itself is is pretty worth it. So it's all good. Okay. Um, I think. Uh, I think that that might be it. Or close to it. There's the uh, the cubicle farm, and then over here are the individual offices. And let's see, looks like we've got one more area kind of right down here. Yeah, here we go. Ah, there we go, a spell scroll. Thank you, peasant and peasant. Um, I'm not sure if they just got forgotten in the coding when they were generated. There are one or two of these wandering around the New World Computing offices where presumably these are supposed to be staff members with names. Um, and they just are peasant, unfortunately. Oh, awesome, a free crossbow. That'll be great. Free bow is always good because it's uh, very important that we gain access to the bow skill as soon as possible for a variety of reasons. Um, and so the fewer bows that we have to purchase, the better off we are. Okay, so now quick inventory check.
We've got some more boots. We don't know what they do, but we know that they are boots. So let's see. At this point, she has the lowest AC. We'll give them to her. Um, this cloak, it, the AC is not as good as the blue cloak. Uh, this is the first tier cloak, just leather cloak. Uh, it could be magical. I doubt it. We'll see if maybe this necklace is magical. Okay, probably not. We'll get it identified later, though. Same for him. Okay, probably not. Okay, and a crappy hammer. All right. Well, we've done what we came to do. And we got a nice gear boost. We got more than enough cash to actually buy some real gear upgrades. And now, technically, after this, we won't need Sharon's help anymore, and I might dismiss her. Uh, we'll see. Because Town Portal at Master Level allows you to transport yourself to any of the major cities in Enroth that have a Dragon Tower. Um, I'm not sure if the Dragon Tower is like how the spell latches onto the city or if there's a little bit of lore there. I don't think that it's mentioned. Um, because where it actually transports you to is the central fountain of the town, but coincidentally or otherwise, the only towns to which you can town portal are the ones with a dragon tower. Um, the other maps, you have to use a different spell if you want to teleport there, called Lloyd's Beacon, which we'll get into much, much later on. Um, but you can also only teleport to a town that, uh, that you visited. So I think she can only take us back to New Sorpagol, which is where we need to be anyway. So, let's leave. Oh, back in Dragon Sand. And you'll notice our fly spell is gone, too. It, it wore off. So, um, we're, we're just going to say bye to these guys. And we're going to ask Sharon to please town portal us. Back to New Sorpagal. Oh, oh, master level. Okay, she will take us to other towns. That's very useful. In that case, we might keep sharing a while longer. Um, but to start with, at least, we're going to head back to New Sorpagal. And here we are. All right, so that's a start to our adventures. Um, I think this is probably a good place to take a break before we and, and Sharon go off... Uh, elsewhere. Um, you know, we probably need to buy some gear and things, but honestly, most of this gold is going to go to skills and stuff, and uh, I think that's something we could get into next time, so I'm going to give this game a save. Now that we're safely back, I usually run two save files and rotate between them. That way, if I get into trouble, you know, one of them's always, always safe. And um, I'm going to thank you all for joining me, and... Uh, I appreciate everybody being in the stream tonight. Um, don't forget to follow if you haven't already. Um, if you would like to see more, join me next time. I'm going to try about the same time uh, as it says in the description below to stream again, especially now that I've figured out, I think, most of the kinks in the programs, the software that I'm using, and especially in this old game, which does not play nice with the tech of 2019. And... Uh, Hopefully I'll see you guys again next time. Tell your friends. Uh, enjoy the other wonderful streamers that I've got hosted on my channel when I am offline, including Sleo9, Gnome Bitten, uh, and Eternal Enigma. And um, I'll try and upload this video to my YouTube channel as well. So search for Cherokee Starfish on YouTube if you'd like to watch this again, or if you have friends that missed the stream. And um, join me again later for some more Might and Magic 6. Thanks, guys.